All right, well, yo, um, can you see everything? Can you hear me? Okay. So if it comes to uh, automating uh, your workloads on a, in an OpenStack environment, um, you're probably all using a number of tools um, that, are, uh, that, that you are quite familiar with. And today I want to uh, uh, present you here a tool, the standard uh, OpenStack um, tool that helps you to automate your, your workloads, uh, and which I assume that has uh, still a number of surprise features built in. And that's what my uh, short presentation is all about. So my name is uh, Niels Magnus. I'm, yeah, does it work here uh, or here? Or just here? So my name is Niels Magnus. I work for uh, Deutsche Telekom. We uh, run in uh, <coughs> uh, Europe the Open Telecom Cloud, but uh, today this is uh, just a plain OpenStack-based uh, presentation uh, telling about um, uh, the OpenStack SDK. Um, I'm working as a cloud architect, and together with my team, we uh, make sure that our clients uh, have the necessary tools available, and that's why uh, we spend some time um, working with the SDK and the surrounding uh, tooling, and um, that's why I'm uh, talking here to you. So you may ask, uh, okay, the SDK, um, what's the, the, the big issue with uh, an SDK? That's pretty easy. So you as a, a developer are here. You have some automation scripts or, s or something like that. You run it uh, through an SDK. It's going over the internet uh, to your OpenStack installation. So what's uh, all the fuss about this? In fact, there's a lot of uh, things uh, to um, uh, uh, think about. Um, for example, you could... Uh, try to uh, address the API directly, as I uh, put in here. Um, if you just want to um, list the uh, existing flavors, uh, it will result in at least something like that uh, that I uh, put here on uh, my slide. But effectively, if you're trying uh, to script this, uh, say in a shell script with curl or something like that, uh, you get very easily to the point where you um, uh, find out that this does not really scale out because there are so many housekeeping tasks uh, to take care of. You have to take uh, uh, um, request a token, you have to manage the token, you have to encode everything, uh, you have to decode uh, your uh, um, answers and so on and so on. So um, that... Um <coughs> What, um, inspired the idea of uh, combining all those tasks into a centralized library, a Python mo module, and which is uh, the SDK. And um, let me just uh, slide back uh, to um, this slide again. And if we look into the details, it looks actually li something like um, this. So we have several subcomponents. I won't go into all the details, and it's all kind of pseudocode here, which I uh, present. <coughs> and it's, uh, this is not the direct code. Uh, um, the SDK has a pretty good um, documentation website uh, where you can find all the API um, uh, documentation. So to get an overview, um, this might help a little bit. So what was the... Uh, straightforward um, workflow is now a little bit more complicated. You as a user connect um, uh, to a um, connection, you get a session in it, and then you use one of those uh, two major uh, layers uh, into the SDK, which is um, the cloud layer, which is a little bit more abstract, or the resource layer, which is the mapping, the one-on-one -on -one mapping, more or less, uh, to the actual um, API 
uh, services. The resources usually implement a number of functions. Usually, um, there are uh, often uh, more than those uh, six functions, uh, but usually uh, it at least implements those, I call it CRUD plus operations, which is uh, create a listing of all resources, uh, getting a specific resource, update it, delete it, and uh, sometimes even uh, to query it uh, if you don't have all information about uh, the object. The, those um, Python calls, they get encapsulated, they get uh, transported over HTTP and HTTPS over the internet to an internet gateway to the specific services. Obviously, there are uh, way more than those uh, six or something I listed here, and everything gets back and so on and so on. <coughs> and that is um, the whole idea of the SDK taking care and easing um, and encapsulating this stuff uh, for the users. So how do you install uh, the whole thing? Um, it's all uh, a Python package, which is uh, pretty uh, straightforward. Um, let us just skip it here a little bit uh, because of um, our limited uh, time. Um, the SDK is actually here. I'd like to uh, mention two more uh, components. So there is the CLI, the um, uh, Python OpenStack client, uh, which consumes more and more um, the OpenStack SDK functionality. And um, I'm pretty uh, happy to see that uh, that gains more and more traction in the meantime. And as an example, this is uh, actually something uh, that we built uh, for our specific um, clients at uh, Open Telecom Cloud, which is an extension and uh, which uh, extends uh, via a plugin mechanism into the whole SDK and uh, extending it. I come back to this in a short second. Well, this is all standard stuff, how to uh, create virtual environments and so on. But uh, the important part is this here. Um, if you have a, a proper virtual environment, just do a pip install update Python OpenStack client. Um, <coughs> and because of the uh, dependencies, um, you will install the OpenStack SDK with that as well. And if you want, and if you are using the OTC, you can also add the OTC extensions as well. So once installed, uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is kind of the um, Hello World uh, uh, slide here. Um, you can either explore the SDK um, interactively, just import the OpenStack package, get a connection object, and then you can go ahead and explore everything a little bit. And this is more or less the same thing. It's a slightly different uh, script in here. This is uh, what you usually do um, or what happens in the background if you uh, type OpenStack server list. Um, it also creates a connection object. And oh, this should be put in here. Uh, iterates over the server and prints them out. That's it. Uh, already. As I mentioned, uh, there are two layers, um, the cloud layer and the resource layer. And here I summarize a little bit um, how they are called. So if you want to write your own scripting in, in the Python language directly, um, you can uh, use the connection object directly to do something like a list server. A list servers, it's actually. Uh, or uh, create image or something like that. That those are high-level functions um, that may um, call in the background a number of the function calls in the resource layer. And the resource layer looks like this. There are hundreds of um, uh, calls like that um, already, and um, the coverage is uh, ever increasing. Uh, I'm myself. I'm not uh, directly a developer, but I'm working together with my team. Uh, um, to support the OpenStack um, project <coughs> um, here to uh, increase the coverage. There is the link to the documentation. 
Uh, let us give it here, I guess, uh, the history of the SDK. Well, m worth mentioning is uh, maybe if you've heard about the shade library is kind of the, uh, uh, mm, well, uh, predecessor um, of the uh, overall library. There are some other components uh, as well <coughs> as the uh, OpenStack client uh, uh, conf libraries and so on. Um, if you ever want, uh, wondered um, how this all involved uh, here, have I summarized it? O37 is the latest version. Yep, sorry, that was, uh, yeah, and <coughs> as I promised, there are a number of uh, uh, features which I will do in a fast forward mode a little bit. Uh, first of all, um, there is a kind of a one-on-one -on -one, relationship uh, of the SDK with the OpenStack client uh, project. The projects themselves are separate projects, but um, as soon as you uh, add some functionality to the SDK and add some metadata uh, to it, um, it can be consumed directly into the OpenStack client directly, so you can use the OpenStack uh, command in your shell script or in other tooling as well. Um, I listed here a brief example, OpenStack server list. You can select and you can format it and so on. And as you can see, currently there are um, 1,000, almost 1,200 um, functions um, implemented at the moment. Um, in the past, we had a number of specific clients, like the Neutron client, the Nova client, and so on. And uh, this is something that is uh, slowly uh, merged and um, uh, transferred into the CLI tool itself. So that we have uh, just a, a single um, uh, tool and a single uh, project with similar semantics. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for that. Um, if you installed everything, and um, next is to configure it. This is uh, a little bit tricky at the beginning, but once you get the hang of it, it's very powerful. Um, there are effectively three ways uh, to configure um, or provide uh, the SDK with your credentials and the other uh, meta information. Uh, you need to uh, connect to your cloud you want to uh, access to. Um, the first is only uh, available, obviously, uh, for the OpenStack client, which is the command line. Um, the second is uh, uh, environment variables, which is uh, what a lot of people seem to do uh, even today. Um, you know, the export OS uh, username equals whatever uh, export OS underscore password, and so on, and so on. Uh, don't do this, because this is insecure, because um, uh, exporting uh, environment variables, um, exported and environment variables can be easily seen on uh, the command line from other users. So better is to use a file, and even for the files, there are several options. You can use um, a file in the current directory, in your home directory or in a system-wide directory, and the actual paths uh, do a little bit uh, differ from the uh, platform to platform. Um, <coughs> yeah, I have an extra slide for that. Uh, let me show you how this looks. It's a, it's a YAML formatted uh, a file uh, where you put several instances of clouds. I have one cloud which is called OTC, and the second one which is OTC admin. Yeah. So this is actually a second file. This is the secure YAML file, and uh, this is the cloud's YAML file, which are uh, um, separate, because um, you can put on the secure um, YAML file even your uh, secrets and then protect those files um, specifically. Once you uh, start uh, the SDK, both files get merged. Um, this is a, um, a warning. Uh, it's a little bit confusing at the beginning um, that 
those two files get merged, but uh, as I um, pointed out here on the last slide, those files, uh, so if you have something in etc OpenStack in, in your config directory and even in uh, your current directory, those don't get merged, but the um, most, um, the, the, the top one wins. So if you have uh, for, uh, by accident, a file, a cloud YAML uh, in your uh, current directory, uh, don't despair if you don't find the, um, uh, the error in your home directory. So this is a warning since I spent some uh, unpleasant hours uh, debugging something like that. So once you have your uh, credentials and, and, and data in here, it depends obviously a little bit on your uh, specific OpenStack instance. Um, those two get um, merged and then uh, <coughs> you can use this uh, short demo code um, to um, verify um, your current installation and your, your uh, current um, configuration because um, this will just create you a YAML output which looks more or less like this. At least it's a, uh, it's a starting point uh, so that you can debug your setup. Okay, before I run out of time, really in fast forward mode, um, <coughs> another very um, nifty feature are the vendor profiles. Uh, so you as a, a public cloud provider or even as a private cloud provider, you can uh, add a file, a system-wide file in the um, uh, profile directory, and then you can just put a profile colon, for example, OTC. We have an OTC uh, profile uh, in the uh, project, uh, and that sets already a number of um, defaults. And as you can see, we have uh, several profiles here uh, already available. I already mentioned it, uh, you can extend the functionality of the SDK if your, um, your personal cloud uh, has some extra functionality that is uh, beyond the, the standard uh, OpenStack um, scope. Um, that's what the OTC extension is for. And as a last feature I'd like to mention are um, the API performance metrics. Uh, Interfaces, which can be very uh, useful if you want to measure the performance of your um, of your cloud and the um, the connection to it, especially. So it works like this: if you have a, a, a script, a, a Python application that runs um, here, it builds upon the uh, OpenStack SDK, and you have uh, three different options how to uh, send out those uh, metrics. You could either uh, push your performance metrics directly into an influx DB or do the same thing with a stat C, um, <coughs> depending on what kind of metrics you actually uh, want to um, play out. Or you could uh, also implement a Prometheus um, exporter. Um, the exporter ex itself, you have to uh, code yourself. Um, but there is already provisions um, built into the SDK so that the data is there already. You just have to stream out the data and you can uh, let it collect it uh, by Prometheus. Okay, that was uh, pretty much on a fast, for uh, fast forward mode. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, um, I see we have uh, prominent uh, uh, developers and uh, uh, um, maintainers of um, the SDK here as well. Um, uh, thank you very much and uh, happy using of the SDK. Thank you.
Hello everyone. Uh, Ni hao, Shanghai. Uh, so today we'll be uh, having a small talk on uh, understanding how to secure Kubernetes uh, using Webhook as well as Keystone. Uh, myself, uh, Somitra Kuntia. I am uh, a part of Ericsson India, working as a solution architect. Um, we work as a part of uh, community contributors to the ASC project. Uh, I have with uh, myself Pradeep. I'll pass it to you. Hello, everyone. This is Pradeep here. Uh, I also work as a solution architect at Ericsson India, and I also contribute to the Airship community. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, Uh, we're having a technical glitch here. OK, so what we're going to talk today. Uh, uh, so agenda is to have to understand a little bit of uh, uh, why do you need a access control in uh, Kubernetes API. And then we'll move on to, to have an overview of uh, some Kubernetes admission uh, control. And then uh, understand what is the webhook mode, how to do that, and how to configure a Keystone Authenticator, and, and then the benefits of that. So let's move on. And uh, so when you talk about access control, why it is required, so you know that uh, the kubelet, uh, it exposes, uh, it pr pr provides the HTTPS endpoints, which gives you access to your nodes and containers, and you have a lot of powerful control over that. But when you have that, you have to be responsible when who can access and what can be accessed, right? So that is one of the need uh, for us to ensure that there is a proper access control is there. So either you can give access for a specific operation uh, to everybody for a specific uh, for all the resources we have, objects we have, uh, or you can not allow them. But doing that, it, it will lose the flexibility what is required for the uh, Kubernetes API or the APIs which exposes. Uh, so what is ne it's necessary is to have something which provides a good access control at granular level where you can decide the privileges, you can decide the permissions for a user that what they can access, what they cannot access. Uh, for example, namespace, ports, or any other resources, and what kind of operations they can do over it. So that is why it is uh, imminent to have a access control permissions, which uh, separates the responsibility and uh, depending on the action a client might perform. Apart from the access controls, the granularity we need to have, we also need to have an authentication mechanism. The Kubernetes comes with multiple way you can authenticate, but Keystones, if you can leverage Keystone itself, it has a lot of advantages that we can leverage apart from what Kubernetes provides by default. One of the, one of the biggest advantages we have is the rotating infrastructure credentials. So we can have Keystone to rotate the, uh, the, your, your tokens um, periodically uh, to make it more secure. And other part is that, uh, suppose you have an OpenStack infrastructure already been using, you have a user base to that, and you also having a Kubernetes cluster, maybe on the top of the OpenStack running on it, and you want to leverage the same tenant users so that you don't have to create a duplicate users for Kubernetes, and then, uh, uh, like example, having an existing LDAP backend for the Keystone or something, this gives you a good opportunity to leverage that, having the same Keystone users can be used for as a Kubernetes user to provide an access grant. So that is what we'll talk about two things. One is having a webhook for access control uh, for privilege, and then Keystone as an authentication mechanism. Uh, going, moving on to the next, uh, we have a high-level overview, how it works, and how the integration happens. Uh, as you can see, there is a uh, Kube uh, a CTL client. So this is all the external uh, communication that happens to the Kubernetes. You can uh, see that. The first thing the kubectl clients do is that um, it can access from version 1.8.0. Uh, we have uh, uh, the kubectl provides an option to integrate the OpenStack environment uh, variables or a Keystone user environment variables. To, it can pull it from there. It can request Keystone uh, to get the token out of it. So once you get back the token, the kubectl client then again passes as part of the request the token. Instead of the credentials, it passes the tokens to the Webhook API server. Now when you talk about Webhook API servers, it's consists of a two part. You can see that uh, it's, it's like a Kube API server containers running as well as a Webhook container running along with the policies. So Kube API server is the one who takes it and then it uh, bypasses it uh, to, uh, to, uh, to your keystone 
uh, to validate, uh, sorry, uh, once it, it passes to the OIBIC server, which again passes on the same token to the Keystone to get it validated, whether that token is valid or not. And once it, it's validated back, the OIBIC takes care of uh, requesting for the airbag policies that it has been defined. And then depending on the, the state of the request, it saves back to the HCD, uh, the, 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 the store that we have for the Kubernetes users. So this is a very high level overview. Let's move on to have little more details of the configuration. And my colleague Pradeep will, uh, will give a view on that. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. Over to you. Thanks, Omitra. So yeah, this gives you an overview. So let's, this basically has two parts, if you see here. One is the client part, and the other one is the server part. So we need to configure the webhook with the keystone in order for, the, for it to authenticate and authorize uh, any, any user who is trying to access any of the resources on the pods. On the, on the Kubernetes cluster. So first, let's see how you can do on the server side, and then we'll see at the uh, client side. So basically, we all know about the Kubernetes admission controller. So admission controller is the one which is responsible for uh, authenticating, authorizing, and also providing access to various resources on the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, first thing that we will have to do is add uh, this webhook filter in the admission controller as part of your configuration. So once you add this, so any, uh, the requests that are coming to the Cube API server will automatically get routed to the webhook. And via the webhook, you can actually configure Keystone, which will do the authentication and authorization for you. So here, if you see, there are two parts again to it in the admission controller, so which is the mutating uh, admission and the validating admission. The mutating admission is basically an interceptor. So it just intercepts any request that comes in, ensures that it is valid. And if it is valid, then it sends you the uh, validation where it uh, validates the token whether it's a valid user and also has the valid role, and then it sends the response back to the client. So the, uh, this is just an uh, example of, uh, uh, that, that was on the server part. So this is an example config file on the client side. So you must have all uh, configured the kubectl config on the, on the uh, .cube slash config file. So this is how you would need to make the modifications. So if you see the highlighted one, which is basically doing the exec, and this is the authenticator that is basically used in order to authenticate against the keystone. So you will need to add this section, and you'll need to create a context, and once you create the context, you can, act, you can uh, route all the calls to the Webhook API server. The server that I'm showing there on the top is basically a, a Webhook API server that I'm pointing to. So this, this uh, config file is for the versions uh, v11 and above. So for the clients, for people who are using clients older than v1.1, v1.11, will have to make a slight modification. If you look at the end, you will have to use, uh, just a second. Probably it's, a, it's on the next slide. I'll just show you, I'll uh, go back to that. So this basically is showing the uh, policy configuration. So now we know that uh, in order to do the RBAC configuration on the webhook, you'll need to define the roles, and those roles have to be existing on the webhook server. Once the keystone, let's say we have an admin role or a non-admin non role on keystone. So the roles have to be defined, and the actions for that particular role also has to be defined as to whether an admin or a non-admin user can access uh, some of the operations, some of the resources in the Kubernetes cluster, and whether he, sh he should be restricted to access some of the clusters as well. So this defines all the actions. If you see there, the verbs g give you whether you can do a kubectl get pods, get uh, list pods, watch operation, and so on. And it is given to uh, only the uh, default namespace, and only an admin or a member role can actually do it. So if you don't want to give the access, you can probably restrict it in this policy file. So this is the one I was talking about. So this is the uh, older uh, client on the, for the older clients, basically, v1.8 to v1.10. And the slight modification, if you see in the bottom of the uh, slide, the auth provider, instead of the exec command that you saw earlier, and you'll need to give the name as OpenStack. So OpenStack is basically a name that I'm giving uh, for my deployment. So yeah, so uh, we have seen how we can configure the client and the um, server in order to ensure that you use Webhook and Keystone. The, what are the, I mean, why would I really want to do it? What are the benefits? So we all know that Keystone uh, gives you so many uh, benefits like uh, the token rotation, the, um, uh, I mean, the token can be rotated. If you want to add a new user with a service account, then you can actually add him easily without really having to uh, change any of the uh, cluster configuration. So you can just add him on the LDAP. If you're using an LDAP user, then just add that user on the LDAP, and you should be able to um, quickly have him access the cluster. 
and this also ensures that some of the uh, p some parts of the cluster are inaccessible if you want only uh, to give some some access privileges to to some resources like for example you do not want somebody to uh, do some destructive operations on uh, kubernetes right so you can just give a uh, get or uh, read only access to some of the uh, pods and uh, other resources so that's that's basically the use and obviously you can uh, also uh, you can also change uh, rules in case if you want to uh, for some of the um, I mean, on the fly, you can actually do a config map, do a uh, get config map, get the config map, and then apply the config map back so that you can change the policies for a particular user. So all those things can be done without really modifying the code. So that those are, those are the benefits that you're getting by um, by doing the authentication or authorization with uh, Webhook and Keystone. So th these are the references. In case if uh, anybody of you are interested to go through this and uh, get more information, please go through these links. And obviously, we'll be reach, uh, reachable on uh, IRC or Slack, so you can always reach out to us as well. Thank you.